coming up on this episode of the Marco Martins Revolution. And at the end of the day, life is a single player game. You have to wake up yourself. You have to brush your teeth yourself. You have to look after your finances yourself. No one's going to pay your rent for you. But there's also a positive and hopeful message around the side hustle is that this is the best time in human history to have one. And, and as, as hard as it is today, it was harder 10 years ago and it was impossible 30 years ago. And I think entrepreneurship, whether it be side hustle, whether it be your main hustle, it's all mental. This is the Marco Martins Revolution, powered by Vodcast TV. Visit VodcastTV.com for more. Um, so I'm not doing intros anymore, but this is Mark Sham. He's a speaker. He's an entrepreneur. He's... A uh, futurist, which I find quite interesting. He's so many things. He's a good friend of mine. We had so much fun on the last podcast. So I'm really happy to have you back. Welcome back, Mark. Thank you for having me. And it was a lot of fun the last time because you are much more than an interviewer. You're a conversationalist. I take that as a massive compliment. I, I think it comes naturally to me, luckily. I suppose I'm lucky that it comes naturally to me. Um, and it's just something I enjoy. I love having conversations. I love speaking to people. I'm one of those people who doesn't cry in a movie when people die, but you cry when the dog dies, right? <laughs> I'm one of those people who's like, oh, people, they're the worst. I don't want to know my neighbors. I don't want to, you know, if I'm carrying groceries into my apartment, hey, Mark, leave me alone. Don't talk to me, stranger, whatever, whatever. But I'm, I also do love people, which is so funny. I love speaking to people. People are my favorite people. Um, and I, I really do want the best for people in general, you know? So it's so funny, this millennial mindset where you don't want to know your neighbor and you don't want to be like overly social with random people and things like that but we still do care deeply for human beings and and i love conversation i love speaking to people i love hearing their thoughts and and their views and opinions on things and um i'm getting better at the idea of not trying to sway people's opinions to to mimic my own that's something i've had to learn is that like if i have an opinion on something and someone doesn't share that opinion rather just discuss it than try and mm. make them share your view so i think that's that's my mindset on this yeah also probably somewhere in there i think it's a combination of a whole bunch of things but somewhere in there it's also about wanting to avoid a small chat which i find very difficult at times so i'm very similar to you i'm an extrovert i love talking to people but god i hate talking to people about nothing right and but then these types of conversations where it's more focused and we know we're going to get to a point and we kind of are more on an even kill. That's fascinating to me. But to some of my neighbors, I, I agree with you. Yeah. I, don't want to, I don't want to know how their day was or why load shedding made them angry. I couldn't really care. Yeah. Uh, there's always that one person on WhatsApp who's like, oh, I can't do this load shedding. It's like, I've had the 16th message from you yeah. in a row of the same thing. Like, I'm aware of load shedding. It annoys me too. Can we move on to something else? Exactly. Right. And this is the something else we're moving on to. Coming up, great event uh, where you're trying to promote side hustles amongst South Africans and mm -hmm. not just promote the idea of side hustles, but rather here are some side hustles that work, that people are doing successfully. It takes up this amount of your time. Either replicate that or mimic that and find some sort of financial success on the side or use that as inspiration to your own ideas and i love that i love that concept tell me more about what's coming up for that yeah if i go back to the thinking behind the event the event is the means to the end but i mean ironically talking about load shedding and everything where we're at south africa is in a precarious spot hmm. i think you can hold two opposing views in your head at the same time so i think that we're actually in a good position in some instances in South Africa, but we also have to be super mindful of where we're at presently economically. And the fact is right now, as we sit here with half the day, not most businesses don't have access to electricity. If we didn't have an inverted our business yesterday, we would have had three hours during the working day. And we're in a fortunate position to have built ourselves up. But I often so wonder about how other people are dealing with this environment so i don't think that we can just idly sit by and hope 
that things are going to get better because hope isn't a strategy. Mm. And at the end of the day, life is a single player game. You have to wake up yourself. You have to brush your teeth yourself. You have to look after your finances yourself. No one's going to pay your rent for you. And so you can't wait for the proverbial shit to hit the fan before you react. And so that's where the side hustle thing has come for me. But then I also know, having been an entrepreneur for most of my life, that side hustles shouldn't be taken lightly mm. and they're actually real businesses. There's mm. no difference. And so now you're entering into the world of entrepreneurship and there's a whole bunch of mental and emotional requirements that you need to gather in order to do this. So a lot of people want the thing. Mm. I want the money, mm -hmm. but they aren't prepared to put the work in to get it. And they don't, for example, appreciate that side hustles are going to come with extreme sacrifice because it's a lot like studying part-time while you work. Like you, you, you're not doing it full time. You, you have, so there's a whole bunch of things that have to shift. So the question is, how well is your life set up for a side hustle? You can't be thinking about the money you want to make only. You have to think about how well is your life set up that you can actually get to the point that you can generate these things. And then just some simple things which we'll get into later. But like the second you get into business, you immediately have to see failure as a rite of passage in business. Because people, especially on the side, they've got a job, they've got an idea that they think they want to implement, but they have no clue what the market's reaction is going to be to that. So they build up all this expectation on one idea. They throw that one dot. It doesn't land the way they think it's going to. And then they give up. And so you almost want to explain to them more the mental and emotional journey that they're about to embark on besides the actual different types of side hustles being service or product mm. based or how long it's going to take. It's like, you need to try to get your head into this because I deal a lot with small businesses and I see the exact same thing happen. The common comment you get is, wow, I didn't realize it was going to be this hard. Yeah. And so it, I was thinking about this while I was overseas watching the stark difference between my day in Paris, London, and Germany, and then looking at what was happening on social media. And I was like, people can't wait and I'd like to just help. Mm -hmm. And that was where the event came along with, just to kind of spark some ideas in people's heads. And as we do, we make the events free. We only now started charging for the stream because I have to bring in extra people, as you know. Mm -hmm. Outside of that, I just wanna, it's like, it's a, it's a way I can play a part to try at least get people's brain stimulated. I think, there's a couple of things I picked out from there. And, and the one is the idea that it's going to be easy and that it's harder. Um, and I don't think we want to put people off. Of course, it's going to be difficult and it's going to be harder. You are starting a business and you're doing it on the side and you have to be aware that if your workday ends at five, your new workday starts at five and it might end at 10 or 11 p.m. But for us entrepreneurs, I guess we kind of used to that because yeah. even without a side hustle, your main hustle will take you till 11 PM. Like I was here last night. So I think that's, that's the one thing to get around, but there's also a positive and hopeful message around the side hustle is that this is the best time in human history to have one. Right. Absolutely. And, and as, as hard as it is today, it was harder 10 years ago and it was impossible 30 years ago. You know, it was impossible. And if you work for a bank and you, get in at, in at 8 a.m. and your day finishes at 5, well, now you've got quite a lot of time instead of playing Candy Crush and watching House of Cards and whatever, whatever famous Gary V words is that, you know, stop that nonsense and you'll find out that you actually have a lot of time to be able to achieve something that will really change your life, that mm. will really give you a, a great opportunity to alter an existence that you may be unhappy with because you don't like working for the bank or whatever. And th this is the way towards it is build some capital, uh, get some skills while you're on the way to it. And then perhaps you have a viable business that you can now push on for and put more hours into while leaving the job that you hate, for example. Yeah. I mean, I th you nailed it. it. The irony of entrepreneurship right now is that it's never been easier, which is what makes it harder because more people are doing it. Right. So on one end, the markets, there are no real brand new ideas. If you think about it in a sense, it's just you finding your niche or a specific angle and then working out how to do that for a long enough time until you break into the market. But what you say is absolutely valid. It has never been easier thanks to tech, AI, mm. or whatever, social media, uh, free ticketing platforms. It's never been easier. But I think what's misconstrued in the mind of most people who have never started a side hustle and they've only worked for a company or a bus is they just don't understand what that journey looks like. So to your point, you're, you're absolutely correct in not wanting to discourage anybody mm. by telling them how hard it is. 
but more find a, a balance by just forewarning them what they're in for, but then just giving them a brief roadmap of what it could look like if they apply themselves. And I think entrepreneurship, whether it be side hustle, whether it be your main hustle, it's all mental. Yeah. That's it. It's it's just psychological. And it's key for a lot of people who have been working for a company or a boss to understand the very key differences. It's not that their job is any less hard or that they're under no pressure. They're just different. I mean, I think about I think about the idea of ever working for someone. Sometimes I just run that thought experiment. Well, I think what they've got is equally hard. It's just a different type of hard. Mm. So trying to go like, look, here in this box, this is what your day typically looks like. And I don't want to speak for you, but I can definitely tell you what this box looks like. And now you're trying to convert the two into one 24-hour day. And you're going to wear this hat here, but you but that hat won't work here. And I just want to show you that. I mean, I don't think any event can leave you walking away with this like, absolutely clear blueprint but it can just give you a rough idea and hopefully spark that inspiration in you to want to have a go and hopefully you if for nothing else you remember two or three key lessons so let's say someone comes to the event or forget the event they just start a side hustle and they just remember some things like failure and we can define that too it's not overall failure just sometimes you throw many dots at a board within a bigger idea and those don't work but it doesn't mean the bigger idea is mm. a failure just how to deal with that what are the different types of side hustles you could start it's a very interesting thing but again the overarching idea simply is that right now with where south africa's at you can't sit and hope that things will get better i think what what gives me the most excitement for this event is that the immediate idea with a side hustle is how isolated it is Right. So most people see a side hustle and it's like, cool, I'm going to be on my own and I'm going to do this thing every night from five o'clock and I'm going to do every part of the business by myself. I'm going to do the marketing. I'm going to do the finance. I'm going to do the, the actual product design or operations. And you're going to do all of those things by yourself. And it's incredibly isolating. And what excites me about the idea of an event like this is that you've got a group of people interested in side hustles culminating into one space and if you can network with the right person where it's like hey i have this really cool idea for a software side hustle that provides people with tickets to concerts for example and it's like cool i really like that idea i'm really good at finance mm. and i'm really good at building a business plan and i'm really good at setting budgets for things and it's like oh cool my expertise are around marketing and sales and it's like wow what a perfect blend you can get because not every nobody is strong in every area mm. i mean it's great to try and build some skills in areas that you're weak but what's really even better than that is having a partner who's really strong in the areas that you're weak Absolutely. and if you can complement each other and that's the really exciting thing for me around events like this is the networking opportunities where you either have an existing side hustle and you need some support or you want to start a side hustle and perhaps you can meet someone else who's inclined in the same way as you are and you'll be less isolated in your side hustle. And it's a bit like a gym buddy where mm. it's like you keep each other modest. Do you know what I'm saying? You like make sure, hey, is this done? Yeah. And you don't allow those like niggling mental excuses to come in it's like no nah, i'm tired today you know it was a tough day at work. maybe i won't do any side hustle work tonight whereas i oh, know that person's relying on me i have to do it and you sort of just push through and it's it's like a bit of a buddy system where you help keep each other motivated so that's a really exciting thought to me is that don't necessarily always think of a side hustle as, as isolated as it is someone else might also want to side hustle with you and even if you need to split the business in a 60 40 split because someone's going to put in a little more work or 70 30 split because they're going to put in a little more work than you're able to put in it's still viable and it's still a great thing to to have 30 percent of a great company five years from now yeah is a really good 30 percent well this is why you're a conversationalist and not an interviewer because that's exactly where i was going to go yeah i mean right now you've got a hundred percent of an idea so you've got zilch so finding someone who is better at something than you. I can tell you from my own experience that having a business partner where one plus one equals way more than two, it's three or more oftentimes. Mm. 
But then there's another dynamic that get in, it gets introduced into the business, which is now you have to communicate with that person. If they've got a strength and you've got a weakness, and then you've got a strength and they've got a weakness, then you have to figure out what that looks like psychologically, mentally, and emotionally. You have to learn how to communicate with each other. But I think, yeah, right now, if someone's got a job, let's think about why someone would want to get into a side hustle. The money is the means to an end. So right now, either you've got a job that you dig, but you just want to make a little bit of extra cash on the side. Mm arguably okay well there's a type of side hustle that could work for that type two is i've got a job you enjoy it or you don't enjoy it but i ultimately want to work toward doing my own thing but mm. i don't want to take that massive leap to go from employed to self-employed and then all the pressure and i often recommend this this is why i think side hustles are so genius is you kind of get to test out your ideas and and let's assume that the person who's trying to start the side hustle is fairly ethical. So they're not totally using company time. They're applying themselves at their job, but they've got the spare time. You get to use your spare time to throw these darts at the dartboard to see what lands. And then finally, if you can come to an event like this and meet other people, and even at the base, if you're just going to meet other people who've got different ideas and that one idea that, or that one thing that they mention when you meet them sparks an idea in your head on the low end all the way through you know what, after this chat, I feel like we should at least have a go. You're both meeting each other at zero. So have a go. Yeah. But then be okay with either the partnership working or not working. Be okay with the idea working or not working. Don't be so invested that I've got this one thing and it has to work. And if it doesn't work, then this whole thing's been a failure. Oftentimes it might just be that that initial idea, the way you pictured in your mind, isn't ultimately what the market is looking for. And there's only one way to test. It's and the it's market. brutal. Yeah, But to your point around being in entrepreneurship for long, the same way working beyond nine to five is now just baked into a seasoned entrepreneur. Failure, or I, it's maybe the wrong term, um, throwing darts at the dartboard and seeing how they work and, and t letting the market tell you if it's not quite what you think it was, I wouldn't call that failure, it's just little experiments, is baked into the process. I don't get bleak when we throw a dart at the dartboard and it doesn't land. It's just, I'm now I'm operating with different information. Amazing. But it took long to get there, as you would know. Mm. Now, I used to take every little mistake, quote unquote, so to heart. Now I'm like, oh, it's just kind of what it is. Well, there's terminology uh, used quite specifically in the tech industry at the moment and big tech companies try to adopt this agile methodology mm. so the agile methodology uh, where you're constantly adjusting and pivoting and the idea is to fail fast fail cheap and pivot and i think a side hustle allows an individual to fail fast fail cheap and pivot in a way that quitting your job and going full-time into entrepreneurship just doesn't allow for because when you do fail fast and you don't fail cheap because you have no other income yeah and you don't now have the opportunity to pivot so doing it on the side allows you to construct the business model in a way that the market will accept so that by the time you're ready or the product is ready maybe this is now the time to leave your job and go full-time into absolutely into and, entrepreneurship. and i think going one further it just came into my head that there's a beautiful saying that i've quoted often entrepreneurship isn't for everybody but everybody should try once Either you're going to f find out quite cheaply and fast that it actually isn't for you. And that, by the way, is totally okay. Yes. Because not everybody is meant to be an entrepreneur. And entrepreneurs don't sit on the, on the top of the heap because they also give up lots of things. There's a trade-off to being an entrepreneur in the same way there's a trade-off to being an employee. Or on the flip side, the skills that you do acquire through multiple attempts of entrepreneurship are super transferable across multiple facets of your life. And I can tell you fundamentally that I'm a better human being for mm. being an entrepreneur for most of my life because I've, the same way I've gotten more used to things not working here, but fail fast there, fail cheap here, and learning to, to pick yourself up mentally and emotionally when something big doesn't go your way has transferred into other facets of my life. So it is super transferable. And I, I don't think you can go wrong by having a go at a side hustle, but if you start with a totally warped roadmap of what you think this is going to be like, it can scar you. Mm. And I think that that would be the, the point of at least the event as a starting point to just give some little, it's like a little pinball machine where you're just keeping people from falling totally on the edges and mm. the game is over. You're just like, Hey, you should know this and you should know this, but everything I'm telling you and my guests who are now joining me 
I've got two other people joining me for the event, Tiffany Markman, Brad Shawkind. Everything they're telling you is just educated guesses based on the experiences that they've mm. acquired. So also take it as subjective. I'm not standing up on a stage or on this podcast telling you how it is. Mm. I'm telling you how it's been for me and what I've observed across multiple businesses in my own life and then what I've observed being part of a small business and business community over time. But take everything I say with a pinch of salt because, you know, we're all just winging it. Entrepreneurial university. Yeah. This is the how to do it in exactly these steps. It's it's just not true. But take lessons from other people. Oh my goodness. What a and I, I think it's why um, you know, like Joburg South, Mediterranean communities, etc tend to stick in entrepreneurial spaces is that you you learn the hard lessons from your parents or whatever and people who haven't had those opportunities who grew up in households where they didn't have entrepreneurial influence you don't want to learn those lessons firsthand you know you rather learn the lessons from someone else yeah and uh i think it, it's a great opportunity for people to listen to some great speakers and listen how they failed and and figure out well i mean let's to flip avoid. it yeah. let me flip it to you right let's just think about the last year so I'm going to put my interviewer hat on for two seconds. Think about whatever you've gone through in the last year. Mm. Can you recall off the bat about some of the lessons that you've learned that have been so key that have stuck out for you in running vodcast in everything that you've done? You've hired staff. You've had to grow in a time where there was still the COVID hangover. Uh, we're in a very different time right now compared to last year, May. Last year, we were still wearing masks. We st I think there was even still a little curfew, if I remember. No, the curfew had gone by then. But yeah. like, there must be some incredible things that you've learned. So what is that for you? I think the, f the most key one that I've learned in recent years with Vodcast TV is that when people say networking is key, right? And I think it's absolutely key. Networking is key when you don't have huge amounts of capital behind your business. I think that is the difference maker between you and someone who's coming in with existing money into a business is networking and network really hard. If I see huge potential in you, um, I'll give you everything for yes. nothing, knowing that I'll get some sort of return in the future. I think the lesson I learned in that is to be selective of who you network with because you don't have all the energy in the world and people will try and suck you dry. And um, yeah, so have good vision for who you're going to network with. Do everything you can for them, everything, and they will look after you in the future. And I think that that's the single best advice I've got in recent years here at Vodcast TV. Yeah, to double down on your networking idea, which I totally agree with you, by the way, I think that we've got a misconstrued idea of what networking is because we, we picture these networking events yeah, horrible. where you almost have this, exactly, <laughs> you, you sit down and you have this like speed dating type interaction with yeah, someone yeah, like, what do you do? What do you do? Yeah. And then you're trying to look for these links quickly and that you're almost trying to circumvent how the real world works. Yeah. So networking in my mind has become, and I'd love to hear your views, become finding people who are doing cool things uh, who line up to you and then figuring out how you can help each other. How do you add value? How do you add value? And just seeing, you, like, again, where can you just assist each other in small things and then it grows into this relationship or it doesn't and you're okay with both. But definitely that, because I've seen at the events that we run, sometimes when we put people on the spot, just, so we did this crazy thing a few years ago where at one of our events, instead of having networking, we got a whole bunch of these giant Jenga sets and we set them out in the breaks and we told people to just play Jenga with each other and one or two other games. That was far more effective to get people to get to know each other because they worked out a whole bunch of stuff about that person, like how well they played the game with each other and how quickly they, like play 30 seconds with someone that you've never met. It's a very interesting way to do it. And then some of them just realized, I really enjoyed playing that game with you. You were sharp. And then before I knew it, they were doing their thing. So it was much more in those spontaneous conversations rather than sit down. Because sometimes people are networking dicks. That's my term. It's like they sit down to get exactly what they can from that person immediately. Mm. But to your point, I couldn't agree with you more about, and I, I know for sure if I pride you for the next three hours, you could just keep spitting out these lessons. Yeah. So networking, definitely, I don't mean it from like the event yes, perspective no, and at all. So for me, when I say networking is building your network of relationships and, well and concentrating on those relationships in a huge way and presenting a lot of value to the right people who are going to be able to present value to you. I'll use the example for me is like, oh, you're the marketing manager of a shopping center amazing 
you could use some of my marketing know-how and services and let's sit down together for coffee and you need an idea for your upcoming Valentine's Day event. I'm not going to charge you and I'm going to sit there and brainstorm great ideas with you because, you, you know, now I'm building a relationship with you and we come up with a great idea, use it. Go ahead. I don't want to charge you for my IP on your Valentine's Day event and you do that for four or five years and eventually you've networked yourself into a position where someone can offer you some value to you while you continuously offer value to them. And I think that's the example of what I mean with Absolutely. networking and relationship building is that if you choose, I've, I've developed three or four incredible relationships in the, the process of building this business and without them, I wouldn't exist. To your point, exactly a year ago, it popped up in my memories on Facebook that I embarked on a free speaking tour. The, the felt like the country was in a shit show. I felt the same way. And I offered that um, within reason, I would do my, this talk around mental health to companies at no cost for exactly a month. And I was selective in the companies I picked. And that actually led to our absolute breakout. And the craziest part about it was walking into these offices and these companies, doing my talk with no very mark ad at the end. At People all. would say to me, like, was like, and here I go, and I hope this helped. And it was the one thing I knew I could really help with, even if it was just a morale thing for that month. I could walk in at no cost to those people, especially the smaller businesses, do this talk, get their brains ticking, and then I would literally just walk out. Thank you for having me. I'm out. And I cannot tell you how many times people said to me, so that's it. You just, and now you're leaving. Yes. And I was like, yep. Uh, well, that was the, I came to help. And I cannot tell you how many times I then got booked as a result of doing 40 odd keynotes in 25 days. Because they'd already now seen me speak. They didn't have to go look at my website or videos. or But I left it in their hands entirely. And I wasn't perturbed by who came back and who didn't. But you can ask my staff that that was April going into May. And we had the biggest month at the time for 2022, two months later. And we tracked every single piece of business. And it led to strange things. Sometimes it was bookings for me to speak. Yeah. Sometimes it was them just using the trust. Sometimes it was in the form of a sponsorship that we have now. Like it just went. So it's never been lost on me, but you nailed it about the being selective. Mm. I'll never forget a corporate whose name I won't mention, but they we should burn their building down, <laughs> taking me on for a free talk, luring me in uh, like a week later that they've got this big event and they want me to speak. And then when I said, okay, well, what's your budget? They were like, oh, I thought you were going to do it for free. I was like, what? I was very clear about the idea that I would do it one time only for the companies. That, that was it. And then they said, oh, no, we don't have the budget. And they left. And I thought that was such an interesting thing. And I put up a post about it on social media, but more just to share the idea. And I didn't mention the company's name. And someone said to me, this is why you shouldn't do it for free. And I was like, no, why would mm. I ever allow one entity mm. to ruin the entire thing? That was the most fruitful time spent that I could come up with. So just that, walking in, giving as much value, walking out, being a bit more selective about it, set us up in the biggest way last year. It's completely understandable when people say that's why you shouldn't do it for free because in a short-term business mindset, the, it's completely counterintuitive to go and do these talks for free it's your time it's your expertise it's the idea of devaluing what you do is like i charge a certain amount to go and do a talk but i've done a talk for free so now surely that devalues the value of your product right check is selling prime for 40 rand now no longer are they really worth 400 rand surely right that's the idea but it's in the long term in the long term vision the the selected few that you gave value to will re-represent that value or reflect that value back to you in a huge way. Well, I was a little bit smarter there too, is that I created a, almost like a separate talk that was part of the speaking tour. There were aspects of it that I stole from the happiness talk, but it wasn't the happiness talk. So, but there was enough value in there mm. flat out. And so all I would say, when they would call me and say, well, would you do that talk? I was like, well, I'd actually like to do the full talk. But there's enough in there that anybody who sat there could hear it again, but get something new. So that's, but that was me create, like I've always been a content creator. So it was quite easy for me to create a slightly different version of that talk to create. I wouldn't do just one of the main things. But then on the flip side, I have done lots of other events, even for big corporates, especially when they come to me and they pitch an idea. We're like, look, it's our marketing get together. We don't have budgets for this, but 
And I can see they're being genuine about it. They're like, it would just be too much to now and take too long to work the way up the chain to get you paid for this. But I know them, I know where they're coming from. And I figure like, it's an hour out of my time. And over the years, I've tracked the return of investment long term mm. to that. And there is no question. But your your point around being very selective mm. holds true. Yeah, because you can't split yourself up in a million directions. And, yeah. and I think that's the thing is being selective of who you network for and and rather give them all your energy and attention than give them subpar energy and attention because you're trying to s spread yourself too thin across too many people. That's so, why Alon raises advice. I swear, I think I sound like a broken record when I repeat his, this phrase that he had. There is no secret to business. Business is just the constant exchange of value. The trick lies in figuring out one, what is valuable to whom, how to effectively create that value, how to widely communicate it. It has sat in my head. That's the easy part of the quote. The hard part is actually figuring out what is valuable to whom because it's moving all the mm -hmm. time. How to effectively create that value is centered around the idea that you don't want to spend 10 Rand to create the value of two. And how to widely communicate it means we're all in marketing and sales even if we don't think so. As soon as you're in entrepreneurship, you're in marketing and sales. Even if you get a marketing manager or a salesperson, you as a CEO are still in the function of marketing and sales. That's always stuck with me. So I'm always trying to run it through that filter. Can I just go add a little bit of value here and then can I look three to five steps ahead? But without being beholden to the expectation that something has to come from it. Because if you throw enough darts, you, you, you'll find the return comes from where you least expect. So being able to walk into a room, deliver a talk at no cost and say, if something doesn't come from this, no problem. But just do it enough selectively that it does. And it has been my saving grace. When COVID hit, it was every relationship that I'd built over a 15 year patch that came to my rescue. It was when suddenly we couldn't run in-person events and we set up a little setup like this, the, the podcast studio, but we were doing it very amateurishly. And that first webinar that went out, people calling me going, I saw what you did for you. Could you perhaps come do it for mm. us? It was all those people that I'd done something with. It was all the social media posts that I'd put up that built the network and so forth. So there is a massive accretion to these things. And again, coming back to the side hustle idea is that a lot of people will watch others let's term them successful people, throwing these darts and see how easy it is. But what they don't see is that like iceberg, top of the iceberg and the whole iceberg underneath. And I know just for me, I've been an entrepreneur since I was about 18 years old. It was incredibly painful going that way. I don't recommend it for people. But the upside or the trade-off, I built lots of relationships over that time and they've all come to. So my recovery post-COVID has been remarkable. Mm. But I keep reminding myself, you're not just such a genius, big boy. What's actually happened is it's largely the culmination of all those relationships over time that came to the rescue, coupled with good ideas, execution, mm, etc. But it wasn't just like, oh, I'm going to start this thing and look at how amazing, look how easy it is, two years. And then putting yourself through hell, sheer hell, I never want to repeat 2022 ever. Mm. That took years of my life. And sometimes I sound like a bitter human being because honestly, I can say it took years of my life 2022 um and so now cool let's let's get on with it so it's all these things i, th I wish more people became entrepreneurs uh, i agree i think there is this wonderful phenomenon happening in corporations whether they be medium-sized or larger corporations where culture is becoming important for their recruitment opportunity you know you're becoming you as the individual with a skill set is becoming more important to a company than they are to you, which was the historic model. And there's this beautiful, wonderful thing happening where you're employed in companies that care about culture and companies with good company culture, your lifestyle in a company with good company culture as an employee is far better than that of years in the past. And mm. I, I have to applaud a lot of them for what they're doing these companies and and they're getting value for it as well they're getting the best talent and they're keeping the best talent and the best talent is being more effective in that way yeah. and you know good company culture is coming and it's getting better but understand that your role changes right you now work for a company where the culture is good and they take care of you 
now you have to take care of them. So the idea of you're an employee, when five o'clock hits, you stop worrying about it. And if something happens, you're like, oh, well, not my problem. And that this was the benefit of being an employee versus an entrepreneur where every little thing that happens affects you deeply, emotionally, financially, your time, all of those things. Whereas with an employee, you are able to remove yourself from it and just look forward to the weekend. Yeah. You know, get through it and then Friday night comes and you enjoy your life and then Monday morning you wake up again and you go to the grind, but you don't really care what's going on. That's changing and that gap is like closing a little bit. And and working for a company with good company culture makes you happier, you get more joy, but you're, the trade-off is that you're going to deliver more for them and you're going to be more emotionally connected when things go wrong. Yeah. And you're going. it's going to be a more integrated part of your life. But I think it's healthier. I think it's healthier to be integrated with your work because you spend so many hours there. So to be doing something that you're careless about, I think is not long-term beneficial. I mean, you touch on such a important topic in my life right now. I have been meditating on this concept of trade-offs for the longest time. I moved to London in 2018 and everybody said, ah, oh, but the weather is shit or the, you, you pay so much more for rent. And I was like, well, everything is a trade-off. Mm. Living in South Africa, there is a trade-off. What started to happen for me is I got so anti-South Africa at a point, especially once I moved. So I get why people go overseas and shit all over South Africa a little um, because you, you've got this overindulgement of all the bad stuff in South Africa. Then you move to a place and all you're focused on what, what works. In more recent years, I've just been thinking about trade-offs across every facet of life. So living in London, incredible trade-offs. Yes, you lose the weather. Yes, you pay way more for rent and you live in a smaller place. You are also living in a, a city where it was, is the capital of human experiences and you are two hours away from 50 world-class cities. The way we travel to Cape Town, people travel all over Europe and it's actually cheaper relative to what they earn to do that. There are these 20 pound specials to get onto a plane and go, which is nothing when you're earning in pounds. Mm. What's the trade-off? Well, every time I arrive back in South Africa, every time, we have a friendliness and a warmth that I cannot articulate to you. It's missing all the time. Places like London, Paris, Hong Kong, New York, they're so densely populated and they've had it so good for so long that everybody just sticks in their little isolated bubbles. When you come home, you experience this warmth of people that I cannot begin to explain to you. And I get now why people who have lived overseas for a while, even right now in the midst of load shedding, corruption and everything in between want to come back home. They, they've now stopped focusing only on what works there and they miss this warmth. They miss the way people work. And yes, they're even willing to trade off with the other stuff. It's changed my whole life looking at everything in trade-offs. If I move to Cape Town tomorrow, I leave Joburg, which I love the lifestyle of Cape Town, but I'm losing my network and a bit of familiarity. Trade-off. If I'm an employee, there is a trade-off compared to what comes with entrepreneurship. So the trade-off is no one gets to tell me what to do as an entrepreneur. The myth of I have my own time. But I don't supposedly have to worry about what, what's happening in the business if I'm an employee. But there are trade-offs to everything. And so bringing it back to your point, there is a trade-off if you work for a company that is, has decided that culture is super important and we want to take care of our people. It means you also have to give more in other places. And so I just find that if... People, we, people in life often look at life in this very linear fashion where we think of everything as being, it's not on a spectrum. So it's like we're good or we're bad. We're happy or we're sad. We're grateful or we're unhappy. You can be both at the same time. If you work for a company, you got to know that there's some trade-offs. If you become an entrepreneur, you got to know that there's some trade-offs. Everything in life is a trade-off. And the sooner you get your head around that idea, the more at peace you will be at life and you'll stop seeing everything as good or bad, binary in other terms. You'll stop being so binary in your thinking and you'll realize that everything sits on a spectrum. And so it's just become so clear to me. It's been such a liberation where previously I think I understood it intellectually, but now really I'm understand, I've got this balance of understanding it emotionally and intellectually. You want to leave South Africa? Go for it. But there's some massive trade-offs. You're going to miss some things no matter how shit things are here. I say quote unquote, you are going to miss it. You move anywhere. You change jobs. You change careers. You leave a loved one. You break up a relationship. There are endless trade-offs. And the only thing stopping you from seeing that is your need to box whatever's happening in life into the single category. 
my ex was bad. Well, then why would you be with her? Like you, maybe you guys didn't work out in the end, but there were many things that were good and bad. It's just been such a, I know I'm going totally, but it's been such a revelation for me that everything comes as a trade-off and it just depends on what you value will depend on. Should you be an entrepreneur? Should you be an employee? Where should you live? What should you do with your time? Everything is a trade-off. You want to travel the world? You're going to miss birthdays. This is what's happening to me. I'm traveling more and more again. I'm missing my closest people. I love it. it. It brings me so much joy. But I'm missing really important things because I can't do both. Mm. So like, it's a trade-off. If I stay at home, then I'm looking at people traveling abroad and I'm like, oh, that's what I want to do. So you just got to be okay. Now, I'm okay with missing the birthdays. I try and make up for it. But I just am aware that that is the trade-off. It stops me from being overseas, looking over the fence and going, oh. I'm like, well, you picked. It's a trade-off. It's such a beautiful thing to, to get to when you just realize that's how life works and you're at peace. Well, I think that's a, a great way to close us off. And I think... Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry the for only thing, <laughs> No, no, no. And I think the only thing that's not carrying much trade-off is winning the lotto. So good luck with that one. If you can <laughs> win that one, there's not much trade-off there. It's just good stuff. Um, and uh, Mark, please give us a website just in case people are catching this podcast after the event has happened so that they can catch up with what happened and maybe look out for future events. Yeah, I would say it's a little bit difficult to give the website because we just... So this event is going to be on the 17th of May, but we are recording it. So if people wanted to have access to the recording post, if they're listening after, they would probably just have to email me, mark okay. at the trist.coza, and I'll arrange it with you. I've made a decision recently that I'm not giving that recording away for free. You come to the event in person, no problem. If you want the recording, you'll pay because of the time and effort that my team put into it, but you can get hold of it. Uh, I promise you for sure we're not making money off an event like yeah. this. 50 rand a stream. You know, it's going to cost me way more to do it, but it's just principle. Uh, and then all our social channels, we Facebook, Suits and Sneakers on Facebook, the Mark Sham public page on Facebook, the Trist, it'll be all over, all over those channels. Okay, so get it on social, Suits and Sneakers and Mark Sham on Facebook and Instagram, etc. This has been a Marco Martin's Revolution episode. Remember, if you want to host a podcast that looks, sounds and feels a little bit like this one, you can through vodcasttv.com forward slash revolution now. You'll get yourself a discount on your first order of a podcast or podcast series. Mark Sham, thank you so much for joining me. Brother, it is such a pleasure talking to you every time and we just have to do it now. Thank you so much for me for now. It's goodbye.